It's time for Tuesday Terror, here on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated R and is recommended restricted for anyone under the age of 17. This episode contains scenes of intense violence. Its content may be distressing to some listeners. And the universe continues unabated. Good morning, survivors. My name is Todd Rage, and I'm an alcoholic. Those of you following my annex for a while know about this, and I'm pretty sure even you newcomers have pretty much gotten the idea that I tend to spend my off-air times feeding the plants with the recycled golden goodness, cheap moonshine, and scavenged boozles. Yeah, great picture there, Todd. It's been 35 years of me barking into this microphone, hoping to keep this town together with information. Trouble is, there ain't none no more. All I'm getting is static from the outside radio bands, from television, from SATCOM, even from HG World. There's no airplanes, there's no citizens' band, there's no military, I ain't got nothing. And here comes that sweet Algonquin winner. Our happy little elves are going to try one more run and get us some stocking stuffers for the season. After that, I'm guessing they're going to be huddled up nice and close in their North Pole shelter until the thaw. Me, I'm putting about 50-50 odds on making it through the winter. I got this mental image of me looking like Nicholson at the end of The Shining by the time we get our first two-foot dumper this winter. Uh, you know, if it ain't the eaters, then it's going to be the cold. And if it ain't the cold, then it's going to be the flu. And if it ain't the flu, it's going to be hunger. And if you ain't hungry, well... My liver and kidneys will probably just give up. Great tidings, I know. But, well, it's realism. Now, if you want to avoid these fates, well, do something about it. And what I'm going to do about it is pick one of those options and, well, run with it. And I pick scoliosis. Yeah, kids, my name is Todd Roginski of Wishwell, Pennsylvania, and I am an unrepentant, penting alcoholic. So here's to the guy who taught me how to build a shine still back in Nam. <laughs> Same guy who taught me to keep my powder dry, keep my weapon clean, and which bugs and berries was edible and which wasn't. So Sergeant Yanchez, here's to you. Oh, boy. I'm tired. I'm tired of not drinking. I'm tired of drinking. I'm just tired. I know somebody out there can hear me, and I know most of you can't talk back, but I got this space in my heart that used to believe in Jesus and Uncle Sam and the Beatles and Zimmerman. But I cleared all that out. I cleared it out because I believe in you. That set of ears huddled out there in the wilderness. You're who I believe in. I'm hoping my words bring you some comfort and some perspective and maybe even some hope. Wish I could pull you up a stool and pour you a glass of this here white lightning and we could sing two or maybe four or maybe even ten part harmony across the valley and raise a real F.U. to the brainless crowbaggers out there. I hope that if there's anyone out beyond this valley listening to my voice that they got better news than we got. I hope they're fair and better than we are. So... Uh, Okay, I forget which buttons to push, and that is definitely a sign for me to wrap it up for Isaac's time. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, and don't forget to bring the cat in. Good night. Oh, that's lovely. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Another day, another dollop of sour shite, Sergeant Wake. Yes, General. Enough with the UN nonsense. I wish you'd address me as Group Captain. As you wish, Group Captain. May as well be Grand Fishmonger for all that matters, really. But I guess if I spent all those years trying to squeeze through the politics in chief of Her Majesty's Air Force... Group Captain. You, you broke into my sentence. Yes, sir. You stopped me in mid-thought. 
You asked that if you ever started waxing nostalgic or philosophical, I should interrupt you and say so. Did I? I have it in writing. I, I remember. Thank you. I brought your breakfast, sir. Four aspirin, toast, tea, and... Tea? We found some berries breakfast and some light biscuits or Jaffa cakes. Uh, is there a reason you're staring at me, sir? Aye, you're not Captain Grant. No, sir. He is still on assignment. Thank you. What about that salty white paste with the meat bits in it that you put over the toast? Creamed beef on toast? Hmm. Yes, we had some of the powdered kind, but we're all out. Too bad. It was quite good and made the toast edible. Now, report. Her Majesty's armed forces made contact with us just before dawn. We're to rendezvous with the Goose Bay Command in 48 hours. If I might suggest, sir... Oh, suggest away. The men report no hostile contact. They'd like permission to open the perimeter. When did that happen? Last report, there were at least 3,000 heading up the interstate. Sergeant Umbali is showing the men how to dress and prepare wild animals. We're preparing a feast. Umbali has also built a smokehouse and is raising up... crops. Crops? He's turned one of our trucks into a hothouse. I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't point out that some of what he's growing is... Medicinal, Sergeant Wake. It seems the use of certain plants reduces the speed of the infection through the body. It also eases the pain. Of course, sir. I only mention it because the Sarge takes a serious dislike to it. Sarge. Oi. She can come discuss it with me after the aspirin takes hold, of course. Ever since she landed in our midst, I've been hearing her bark in my sleep. Yes, sir. She's actually speaking to you right now through subkey radio. What? She wants you to wake up. You are in great danger. The message is, wake up, you stupid fuck. Wake up. Wake up, you stupid fuck. Wake up or you're gonna shock. Wake up. Fuck a duck. Wake up, Captain Jack. If I gotta sit this out, so do you. Seriously, that was refreshing. Where are you? I'm over here by the wellspring. Your sniper has me sort of... Pinned down? Yeah, she does that. I can't figure you out. How many people do you have out there? Why don't you come out here, have a sit, and we'll work all this out. Oh, there's no way I'm coming out there. I saw the trajectory of the shot your sniper took. I'm quite happy where I am, so sorry. I guess you're going to have to bleed to death. Or... You can crawl back toward me and I'll beat you to death with my rifle. That might be an honorable way to carry out your original sentence. Or I hope these oars get a little more helpful. You can call off your sniper, declare surrender, and bring him in from the cold. Or? I can shoot you right in the head from here. Nah, not a good choice either. You have an option where we all get together, patch up a leg, drink some wine, and watch some American football bloopers. I love those videos. Jesus, you're just unreasonable. Aye, I am at that. But hey, I think your recon people are due to check in soon. You might want to see how many of them are left. How many men do you have out there? That's not the right question you want to be asking me, Mr. Ying. I'm really tired of this, man. Obviously they can see you. They know you are well and totally screwed. Well, they never did like me much. You know how it is. There's always somebody out there who wants your job. General Olson, give me General Lethem. Now. Hey, now, lay back there, Spartacus. I hear you, mate. So, while I'm bleeding into your finely tended dirt lawn, you mind if I ask you something else? Since I've got nothing better to do than watch you bleed to death, go ahead. You're in the baby-making business, you said. Putting aside the obvious question, why? Tell me, what do you do with a wee buggers once they're born? We keep them milked and warm until the Gujis come for them. General, you need to take this one. Throw me the radio. <laughs> nice arm, Nancy. This is General Ying. Report, please. Hello, General. Who is this? I work for the two men you're holding, one of whom is bleeding all over your lawn. Good. 
then you know you should surrender before something very bad happens to him. Once he goes, we'll go to work on the other one. General, please do not assume that I'm operating under any obligation to keep them alive. I'm simply saying that if either of them is harmed, I will be put out and irritated. Your little ghillie show here, that's no concern of mine. But if you do anything to either of them, I'll turn it into a pile of debris, right over your remains. How, by playing hide-and-seek with your pea shooter? No. Indirect fire. Nerve cast. Maybe I'll catapult a few eaters into your camp. Or just some rotting animal carcass like they did in the olden times. Oh, see, then we, uh, we have a problem. See, I'm morally neutral on this whole thing. But if you can find your way to open fire on a camp full of civilians, you know, women and babies, then there's nothing I can say or do to negotiate with you because you're just too damned evil. I take it you've eliminated one or more of my men? Not sure how many you sent out, but I've eliminated a Steve, a Bob, a Pat, there was Ed, and then some of the guys whose name I didn't get, but he kind of looked like a Pat Oswalt. Hmm, that's unfortunate. Olson, I want a team of six out there. I want our boys brought back, and I want this woman mounted to a phone oh, pole hey, by morning. Oh, hey, General... Those men are in an abandoned toilet about 50 yards south of your main gate. Surrounded by eaters now, and... Oh, hello there, handsome. What? Oh, shit! You poked your nose out there, didn't you? The key to successful negotiation is to not antagonize the aggrieved party. No, the key is to keep the advantage. I could have just dropped you, but... You seem like you're still in the mood to negotiate. I don't negotiate. I'm disappointed. Oh, now you don't sound like the man in charge of this nut hut. Who should I really be talking to? I'm it. Hello? Okay. Sorry. Now, I didn't get this one's name, but the patch on his work shirt says Skip. Please extend my condolences to his family. Who's the cutie right behind you? Cutie? That's... Oh, Olsen, down! Cut your losses now, mate. She's just waking up and had a bad last few months. Who is she? United States Air Force. Sniper. Yeah, I guess that part. She sounds hot. Oi, she works for me. Don't get me into a whole harassment thing. How'd you meet? You serious? You want me to flashback now? I got the time. Oh, fine. Sarge literally fell into our ranks one day in September. We were in the middle of a firefight with a rotter head the size of a small Welsh hamlet. I think the lot of our group squished a hundred or so. She took out about five times that money. Great fighter, awesome on the ground. How about in the sack? I don't know myself, but legend has it she has teeth down there, mate, and a barbed tail that she uses to skewer her enemies. <laughs> anyway, she's a classic psychotic hard ass. Once upon a time, she. <sighs> What's your problem, Sergeant? Am I entitled to just one, or would you like the top ten? The men say you did not waste a single shot out there. You'd have left if you hadn't have taken a blow to the head. Yeah, I gotta thank one of your men for his dexterity. Why'd you want to run? I prefer being alone. That's not a problem, it's a preference. Who are you attached to? I am between commands, sir. Right now, half my unit reports to the president and the other half is committing treason. I just don't know which is which. Understand. Name, rank, serial... Sarge S. Sarge. Rank, Master Sergeant. One up, five down. Serial, whatever you need it to be. I doubt the UN wants it, and I won't be getting a paycheck anytime soon. Are you crazy or insubordinate? I don't care, I just like to know where you're coming from. Both, Group Captain. In equal amounts. Great. Listen, the only reason I bring it up is that I need your help. 
You need me to lay off the men about the illegal mind-altering plants they've been raising and smoking. Psychic, too. Sarge the Psychic Sniper. Also need a creative and motivated self-starter who can put a biscuit-sized hole through something or someone from a great distance. What's the job pay? Two, maybe three hots a day. A cot, ammo, gear, an ear to listen and someone to remind you that you're just plain awesome. That last part. Can I trade that in for something useful? Like? An S-401k? PTO time? I don't get you, Sergeant. Not surprising, sir. No, I mean, you're so adamant about being left alone, not being seen. But you go out of your way to call attention to yourself. You're openly hostile and aggressive toward the men. Perhaps I'm overcompensating for a lousy childhood, sir. I could be locked in an existential crisis. Maybe I have trouble with male authority figures, gender identity questions, or an inability to, quote, know my place, unquote. All of these have been offered by previous commanders as explanations for my total lack of being what they thought I should be. Sir, I would be most happy to add yours to the list. You aren't like other mudhuggers I've met. You're all polished and pressed. Did you find a laundromat out there in the wild? You do wear the uniform well. Not as well as a little black dress, sir. But there's seldom a call for a Vera Wang out in the field. <laughs> I like you. Thank you, sir. For the record, I think you're pretty spiffy, too. But please don't tell me that you're one of those borderline, alcoholic, tin star types who thinks he can just use his rank to curry favor with the ladies. Not at all. I crossed that border long ago. And the only way I can get my jollies is by breaking the sound barrier or blowing something up. If my eyes linger inappropriately, please chuck it up to the mere echo of my former rutty, turgid self. Self-deprecation. Sounds defensive and rings slightly false. The attempt to obtain passive permission to leer at me is slightly pathetic, though. <laughs> yeah, I do like you. You're going to be shooting things for me, aren't you? Yes, I think I will. Fantastic. That's all that matters. Sergeant Wake! Oh, that and bugger off about the Rastafarians. Yes, sir. Place Sarge here on the roster, then escort her to see the quartermaster so she can re-am and re -sup. What name should I put on the roster? Uh, <laughs> I guess Sarge will do. I think everyone in camp will know who we're talking about. Thank you, sir. Anything else? No, sir. I except you might want to pay attention to the man pointing the rifle at you now. Oh, right. Dismissed. Yeah. Christ in a soup bowl! That's just mean. Come on, man, it's fun. Just shot me in the leg, you get. I didn't like your story. Except for you trying to do all the voices and talking to yourself. I think you're about a quart low now, man. Ready to put up the white flag? You know, I've had about enough of this. All of it. Too bad. I'm having the time of my life, friend. Bully for you, keeping a positive attitude about the world falling down. My life is way better. I hated that life. You know what I used to do for a living? I sold insurance. Oh, you poor bastard. Yeah, I literally prayed for something like this to happen, you know? I was in so much debt, in trouble at work, through no fault of my own, of course. And the day before the first case hit America, my wife served me with divorce papers and my girlfriend told me she was preggers. Oh, I know this song. And the next verse, your dog steals your pickup truck and pees on your steel guitar. You're serious, aren't you? Oh, you betcha. So you can skip the whole let's all come together and rebuild the world nonsense. I like this world. It fits me like an old pair of jeans. <laughs> Fuck! Again! I guess she didn't like your story either. What? She can hear us? As close as she is, she can probably smell you. What? Hi there. This is about as close to a woman as you'll get for a while, so... I wouldn't go ruining the moment... Okay, partner. Are you sure you want to do this? He's not moving, okay? Just stop looking at me like that. It's my dad. He made it up there. I'm taking up some water in a first aid kit. Take this, too. What? Why would I need that? Think, Ronnie. Fine. Okay, you got about a two-minute window before they mob us. Get up there. 
I think the last time they punctured the radiator. If I idle too long, the truck starts to overheat. Don't leave us, Hicks. Not planning on it. The truck might have other ideas, so be prepared to brain our way out of that. Go! It's just high enough they can't reach. Lucky these things can't climb. I'm coming, Dad, I'm coming! Where the hell are they all coming from? Come on, girl. One more time around the tornado magnet. Dad! Dad, is that you? You're moving. Wait. Kiddo? You're alive. Hey, you made it. But you shouldn't be here. Can you sit up? No. Don't move me. It hurts. It hurts too much. No, don't even touch me. Where's Mom? Where's Ashley? Kiddo. No. Oh, I'm sorry. No. You were supposed to get everyone out. You didn't answer my calls. You should have... should have gone. You... Oh, I'm so glad to see you. I'm sorry. I know you did everything you could to... <coughs> no. <coughs> I, I deserve it. We locked ourselves in, but we had a visitor. Visitor? One of your friends. Uh, that Gray character. Gray came to the house? Yeah. He showed up banging on the door. Said he was hurt. So we let him in. No! Oh, my God! He said he had news about you and Hicks. Said you were up in the mountain. You should have stayed there, kid. What did Gray do? As soon as he got inside, we knew something was wrong. Your mom was trying to bandage him up when she realized he... he wasn't bleeding. Before she could do anything, he... <laughs> oh, God, kiddo. Ashley and Vance, they got, they got in the van and were headed your way, but... They got stuck down on Gulch Road inside a mob of those things, and that was it. Well, I tried to shoot off as many as I could, kid, but only so many bullets. Why didn't you go with them? Gray punched my ticket when I tried to get him away from your mother. Your shoulder. I just saw. He was talking, Duncan. I ain't seen none of them do that before, you know what I mean? Save your strength, Daddy. Look, kiddo, I know I'm not your real daddy, but I tried. I did, I did, really. You did fine. A few screaming matches aside, it's been... Wait. Something's wrong. Yeah. I figured I'd go out with a bang on top of the world. My family always thought I'd end it all on top of a water tower with a rifle. Stop it. Stop talking like that. What's the matter, kiddo? You look like you've seen a ghoul. Not again. Daddy! I'm sorry it had to be you to climb up into the web. I'm really hungry. Let go of me, Daddy! No! I'm just gathering up my strength here. I'll make you a deal, Punkin. You get me that other boy and bring him up here, and I'll do him instead, okay? You're horrible. Horrible. Let go of me! Oh, I never pictured you ever pointing a gun at me. Now, uh, waggling your finger and telling me you're smarter than me and better than me, but, but a gun? <laughs> you're not yourself. I'm so sorry. You know what Ronnie needs? Ronnie needs a hug. Stay there. Gray controlled it. You can control this. Right. Absolutely. I think I saw your mother wandering around down there. You give me what I want and we can be a family again. You're not my father. I don't care what you are. You killed my daddy. Aw, oh, boo fucking who, punkin? Boo fucking! <laughs> Bye, Dad. Come on! Get down here! Can you move him? No. He's, he's gone. I'm sorry, but this motor's starting to smoke. We'll probably have to hoof it back up the mountain on foot. Let's just go. You okay? I thought I heard a shot over the truck noise. Let's just go. And the award for the most appropriate reason to use the word fuck goes to... I'm sorry, Hicks. Don't be. There's what, five? We can take them. And how many between here and the main road? Then up Main? Up the mountain? You were right about all this. We got about a dozen rounding the corner on Maple. If we're going to do something, we got to do it quick. I don't know, Hicks. I don't know. Think. 
How do we get out of this? I'm thinking, but I'm not sure it helps. Well, it's been nice, kiddo. Wait. I've got an idea. Lay it on me. Quickly. Hello, Head. Let me get that pillowcase off your weird little buggy out I want you to know that I buried the rest of you somewhere over there. Hicks wanted me to run over your head with the car. But I thought, mm, after all, you put them through, I'd do something better. Oh? Oh, how is it you can still talk? Ooh, I see. What a kooky zany green tongue. Huh? Is that what's keeping you keeping on, huh? Come on, turn back. No thanks. I want to show you my favorite thing in the whole wide world. It's the only thing I kept when I was a big dot com guy. This is my barn. Joe keeps stuff here. Oh, there's my little loops. Oh, no. No, here. I'm gonna put you down here on the stairs so you can get a nice view of my dresses. Looky that. You know I was once a millionaire? Of course you didn't. See the goose egg. But yepers, I was a millionaire. My buds in the sea were buying horses and beamers. Me, I bought this cherry. Isn't she pretty? What the fuck is that? Oh, Mr. Gray. This is a 1973 Oldsmobile Delta 88. Not just any. It's dirty yellow, poor door. 455 rocket V8 with 4 barrel carburetor and 250 horses. Dual exhaust, hard top, cloth interior, autographed by the chin, his own bad self. You know who that is? <laughs> and the warm thing it's been missing all this time, I never thought I'd find. <laughs> Mr. Grey, on a stick! Do you know what these things are, really? They are devils. All right now, Mr. Fisher. They're the sum of our darkest urges, slaves to the will of Satan. Mr. Fisher, the children, we're trying to keep things calm. I know that, Mrs. Garrison, I know that. But we always talk about the what, the where, and the who. But never the why. The symbolism is unignorable. The significance is obvious. What is the significance? We're the chosen ones. We survived. Is it possible that we could change the subject? I'd like to have a meal without thinking... See that, folks? It's denial. Only the chosen will have clarity to see the rapture. (laughs) Now, Mr. Fisher, I think one long-winded moralizer in this place is enough. You trying to take my job? Oh, hello, Reverend. What do you think the significance of this event is? Before we talk shop, did any of you think to lead us in the blessing before digging in? I see from your bashful faces that you did not. Well, that won't do at this table. Let's put down our forks and knives and join hands a moment. Dear Lord, thank you for sharing this beautiful day with us. Thank you for bringing these wonderful people to our door and giving them safety and shelter. Thank you for giving them the drive to work together and the spirit to care for one another. And thank you most of all for the bountiful meal, so generous and, I'm sure, delicious. Please bless every one of our members as we continue to serve in your name. Amen. I know you're all starved. Dig in. Reverend, do you ever wonder why we were blessed with living through this? I wonder every day, Mr. Fisher. Man alive, these mushrooms are delicious. Thank you. I sautéed them in red wine. We finished building up the fences this afternoon, Reverend. Excellent work, Thomas. We'll still have to keep watch. 
I'd like to see two people walk in the churchyard at all times. I'm sure our secret Eden won't stay secret very long. How is baby Vanessa, Mrs. Green? Doing fine. No fever anymore. Thank goodness we have medicine. Yes. We will have to discuss how and when to go foraging. I'm afraid the fire destroyed what was left of Augie's market. Perhaps there's something in Fairview or further south. Speaking of heading out, has anyone given consideration to the proposal I made Sunday night? Some. I still think the plan needs some detailing. Well, I don't think this will be a viable shelter over the winter. There's 60 of us, right? Well, there are only eight rooms in this entire church plus the basement. And that old barn. Every time we venture out for supplies, we run the risk of contaminating the camp. I know we're all cramped, and I'll be the first to say I'm uncomfortable sleeping so many on pews, but... Then we should either head north or head south. How about east or west? Doesn't matter which direction we go, Mr. Fisher, so long as we know it's better than here. Where do you propose we go? I hear that these things are going to freeze over the winter. See? We may as well head north. To? Well, I don't have a map handy, but there are a lot of places north of here. See? That's one of the missing pieces to the puzzle. We know that this is one of the last places in the country, maybe on Earth, affected by this plague. So anywhere we go... But we can't stay here. Mr. Fisher, I understand your urgency. Looking about the table, I see that sense of urgency. To do something, anything is shared by many of you. God saw fit to deliver us all here, above the threat. I don't believe he wants us here forever, but I am very sure that he wouldn't want us to waste the opportunity by not planning out our next move with care and diligence. So what do we do? Well, we pray. And we help each other take a breath and consider both what we've lost and what we have left. We feed one another. We get to know each other and what we can contribute. Meanwhile, we can scan the airwaves for signs of life elsewhere and continue to secure our safe house. The devil is in idle hands, Reverend. The devil is also in the heart of the impulsive. <laughs> Give me a destination. Offer me a plan to get there. When the people who built this church set out from Philadelphia in 1782, they never saw this hilltop. The followers had no idea what this town would look like, and they couldn't imagine the beauty of an autumn sunrise across the valley as seen from the hilltop. They had foresight to follow men with well-laid plans. When you choose to lead the faithful into the wilderness, you must have an idea where you are going, how you will settle there, and how you will protect every living soul on your way. I don't understand this. Then I don't know how to guide you, Mr. Fisher. I would hate to see any of you venture out and find yourself worse off than you are now. We know what we have here. We're safe. For now. Fall is turning into winter, and I don't want the children here out in the elements. Of course anyone is free to leave this place. But I hope if you have a place to go, you'd share it with us so we can help you get there. This fish. Trout, isn't it? Oh, it is excellent. Well done, Kevin and Jane. Douglas? Hello, Doreen. Thank you for your help with dinner tonight. Where's Aaron? You're welcome. And he's playing with that boy, Thomas. How is he holding up after... He's coping. That's about it. The biggest thing is not hearing from Frank, his father. I'd feel very uncomfortable leaving here without him. He's up at HG World, right? I think so. But he thinks we left with that group of soldiers we met after we were split up. I have to get word to him. Well, I know Thomas lost quite a few people. Perhaps the two of them together will help them both with the grief. I just hope we can keep it together for the next few days. Call when the Mr. Fisher is going to head out soon, taking a few of the younger folks with him. That has me very concerned. We could use the strong backs and the young eyes, but... You said we're all free to go as we choose. I guess sometimes we have to let people make bad decisions. That's not what we're about. We're supposed to help people make the right decisions. If he leaves by himself, that's one thing. 
But if he convinces anyone else to go, I, well, I just pray he has more of an understanding where he's going. But you're right. Vences and Gates are there to keep things out and our people in. I'd like to take a ride back up to the warehouse again, perhaps at the start of the week, to give them time to calm down. Oh, Pastor Dawkins, uh, did you have a chance to check out the barn to see if we can move some of the older boys out there tonight? Oh, yes, I forgot, Mrs. Green. I'm so behind in my work. Give me a few minutes. I can do it. I just finished on kitchen. You just need to get a space count, right? Yes, and check for rats, beehives. I don't want to put a bunch of teens in there without scoping it first. We may need to move out a few things. Please, let me. I know you've got a lot on your plate. Thank you, Doreen. What's next on the hit parade, Mrs. Green? Mr. Uruk wants to know if you do a confessional or something. Or oh, something. Hmm. Not my thing, but I can do a wicked sermon on absolution. Think there's an audience? They're waiting to hear something, Pastor. Let's be off, then. No rest for the weary. Or the wicked, Doreen. Thanks again. Hello? It's really dark in here. Can someone please tell me what's going on? Please? All the lights are out. Dirk? Kirk? Cujo? Hello, anyone? Hello, you. Ah, who are you? You cannot tell by my touch. You were so intimate with my touch, hanging me over the corpses. Joe? What's with the accent? Is that the question foremost in your mind? You disappoint. Kirk! Dirk! She's over here! She's... I don't want to discourage you from shouting, but you know that they dislike you a great deal. They wouldn't mind putting holes through you to get the meat. What do you want? Nothing. But the children do. What? They are so hungry. Can't you see them? It's pitch black, you crazy bitch! Ah. Uh, of course. Children, come say hello to dinner. <laughs> Dirk? Where are you, Dirk? Here, Ringo. Come here, puppy. Ringo? I think Ringo's over here. What's left of him? What did you do to my puppy? Oh, for Pete's sake. I didn't do anything. Why don't you come over here and see him? I can't move. Something knocked out the lights and stuck me in the back. I can't feel my legs. Dirk? Yeah, well, sorry about that. Grant, can you move? Who wants to know? It's me, Joe. We must get out of here. Why? Because I'm about to close this circus of freaks, and I wouldn't like you to be caught here when it happens. I can hear you. Why can't I move? Because of the venom. Oh. Huh? What the hell are you talking about? I got your brother in the neck and you in the ass. Figure it out. Ah, damn dog. I can't put my weight on my right leg. I feel like my guts are going to squirt out of me. How romantic, darling. Lean on me. If we can get out of here in 30 seconds, it would be a very good thing. Is this the command center? For real? There doesn't seem to be much commanding here, is all I'm saying. So the Air Force is hiring supermodels as snipers now? What a sweet thing to say. If you were a frat boy on the mic, but you're what? Enjoying the dark side of your 40s? Well, tits and bits aside, I was actually referring to that 
empty, soulless expression, the eyes that don't seem to be attracted to anything. You're so, like, beyond everything. He's distracting us, boss. The reason this place is dead is that the real commanders aren't here. What are they? General Ying. I don't know, sweetie. I'm not their calendar keeper. Sir, he says he doesn't know. Yeah, I heard him. He's not lying, I mean. How are you feeling, sir? Vengeful. A little light-headed, uh, but mostly vengeful. Um, a lot light-headed. Ah, oh, do you need a wooby? A little stuffed sheep, maybe? Feel free to beat him up a little, Sarge. He's cuffed to a metal chair. That just wouldn't be civilized. WTF. Oh, sounds like the fun is starting. Okay, okay, what is it you people want? Where are the babies? <laughs> Sorry, none are here. We're between shipments. Shipments? We sent them along with the Gujis to their new home. There's that word again. Who are the Gujis? I'm not authorized to tell you that. Mm, how about this? I'm going to grab a paint scraper, peel the skin right off your face, and write you a new authorization on it. With your penis. Wow, subtle. Now this is a free market economy, completely deregulated. We can make a deal, Robin Hood. You take some of our stores, blow them up on some of our trucks, and take your show on the road, delivering good cheer and dietary supplements to those people holed up in office buildings or shopping malls around the country. Bring your men in. I'll make sure my men, what's left of them, back off. Redirect. Who are the Gucci's? There's a boning knife in the upper right-hand drawer of my desk. If you're feeling really sadistic, I've got some sandpaper and a salt shaker in the next room. Lemon in the fridge next to the Corona. He thinks he has a high card in his hand. My guess, sir, is that they've got about 20 men. If they raise the drunken mob, 50 to 60 natives with pitchforks. Not a big thing, but I'm not a fan of shooting up civilians. Like I said, no strings. Keep me here with a gun to my head. I'll radio Dirk or Kirk and make sure they open the gates. Unless, of course, everybody in your team is already inside. We can't go shooting up the place if it really is a baby farm. Sorry, I can't help you there. I guess you'll just have to either make good on your threats or grab a chair and stick around until they come back. They who? The Gujis, of course. I've got the time. Do you? Hold still. How are you feeling? Like a military academy. Bits of meat keep on passing out. Oh, Douglas Adams. I didn't peg you for a fan. Ow! Who the hell are you and what did you do with Joe or at least her accent? Darling, I am like onion. I have many layers. Would you prefer Betty Sue round the world for a bottle of shine, sweetie? Maybe you like tiny geisha with strong hands and soft skin? That's enough. Which one is the real you? I think this one, Tovorich. For your purposes, anyway. Settle down, Mr. Grant. A few minutes more. These bites are deep. Did you have to kill the dog? Da. Are you gonna kill the moose and squirrel, too? What moose and squirrel? Never mind. Damn, lady. Are you using yarn to stitch me up? No, but you could keep moving and make me poke you somewhere very unfortunate. Fine. Keep my mind off things. What the hell did you just do? I put kerosene tank in the barn, an improvised explosive charge. Where did you learn that? KGB? No. My sorority at Northwestern University. God! Did that damn dog break a tooth off in my leg? Stop crying, you big baby. There's something digging into the nerve. Ah. Okay. What's our opposition? Twenty armed men. 
about um, ten are dangerous, six are very dangerous, and the rest easily distracted by shiny objects. You don't think these other guys laying about will cause a problem? The customers? Yet we have the advantage. They are mostly intoxicated and distracted by the bonfire. We should make our way to command center, locate your friend, uh, the doctor, and, as you say, get the fuck out of Dodge. Who are you? I am Baba Yaga Kostiana Naga. I am a fox in winter. Put the mask on me and I am the Lactrodectus pallidus, the white spider of the Caucasus steppes. A white widow. That's great. <laughs> well, I like to cater to all my clients' whims and wishes. How about you channel up a medic or turn into a surgeon? What do you think I've been doing all this time? Auditioning for play? Your bloody groin is not something I enjoy staring at. Howdy, folks. Well, fuck me with a chainsaw. Do we have the time? I got you in the neck. You should be- No, sweetheart. You got me in the collar. There's a reason guys like us are called leathernecks. Next time, confirm the kill before you kill the lights. Oops. Should have saved your hairpin. Oh, shut up. If not for me, you'll be Dog Biscuit. Oh, so now I get to be a hay bale? Look at this guy. He's got a pitchfork. <laughs> you brought pitchfork? All I could find on short notice. Oh, my Slagaya. Kirk was right about you, Joe. He pegged you for a spy. You with Grant? Oh, darling. How did he know? I thought you were both of the same mind. Perhaps he was the smarter of the two. Lady, I really don't care. You move, the old man on the ground gets four more holes. You just hang out. Guards! Mrs. G? Hey, I thought I saw you come in here. Hello, Tom. How are you holding up? Okay, I guess. I finished up my chores in the kitchen and Reverend D sent me out to check the fences. What are you up to? Well, the church is getting a little cramped and crowded, so I thought I'd come out and see if we could put some people out here. But even if we could, it will be getting cold soon. How many people are there now? I don't know. Close to 50? It's a small church. <laughs> Works for me. It's private and got a great view of the sunset. Oh, is all this your stuff? You've got a pretty nice little bachelor pad out here. Are you sure you want to sleep out here this far from the church? It's fine. Besides, it's good to have someone up here in case something gets through the fence. I keep my dad's colt and one of the rifles up here in case. Does Pastor Dawkins know you have those guns? They aren't his. I'm keeping them for protection. Your protection. Is there something on your mind, Tom? I was talking to Aaron. He... What is it, Tom? He keeps calling me Ryan. That's... that's his brother, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it was. I... I'm very sorry. It's been a rough month or so for us. All of us. Yeah. He seems like a good kid is all. I know what it's like to lose somebody. You were married, right? Am. Mr. Garrison got separated from us up at HG World. Wait, then, then why are you here? It's only like five miles or so away, right? Thank you for taking an interest in Aaron, Tom. I appreciate your trying to keep things normal. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, anything I can do, Miss G, <laughs> happy to help. You have to understand that Aaron is having a hard time letting go of his brother. It was hard enough being separated from his father. I'm very sorry about Aaron. I'm sure it makes you feel uncomfortable. No, it's fine. I think he looks up to me. I think he's having a tough time. He doesn't know that it's okay to care about someone since Ryan... Since Ryan... You know? Died. <laughs> yeah. He feels guilty because you pay attention to him and have sort of taken him under your wing. Yeah. Well, he's a good kid. I like him a lot. He needs a father figure in his life. Well, he understands that his father is away. 
I, I could be a good father for him. Uh, you could be a good friend to both of us. Tom? Y yes, Doreen? You, you were zoning out there. And it's Mrs. Garrison, if you don't mind. Tom, you're leering. Leering? What does that mean? You should look a woman in the eyes when you speak to her. Oh, I'm sorry. With the light through the slats, you look very pretty. Okay, Tom. I'm going to leave now. You're making me uncomfortable. Why? Because you think your husband is still alive? He is alive, Tom. And that has nothing to do with your inappropriate behavior. You need to accept it. I heard that they checked and double-checked the list. Don't you think if he was alive, he'd do everything to make sure you knew it? I'm just saying. <laughs> you weren't there. You do not know what you're talking about or, or how hurtful you're being. Just leave me alone. It's okay. It's better once you accept it. I know it was for me, and I lost my whole family. Some of them tried to get into Augie's market to eat me before I escaped. And uh, here, it's going to be okay. Uh, let me hold you and... Stop. This discussion is finished. You're being vulgar and offensive. I'm just telling you the truth. The truth you can't see yourself right now. You presume much. Too much. This whole world is inappropriate. Look, Doreen, this place has become a new Eden. Like Pastor D said, we need to think about the future. I lost everyone I ever had. I don't feel guilty being there for Aaron. I already asked him if he'd be okay with me seeing his mom. <gasps> that was not a question you should have asked him. Completely out of bounds. As much as I hate to say so, you are to stay away from Aaron until you can discuss this behavior with Pastor Dawkins. You think he'll be a better man than me? Step back, Tom. Step- I know you're upset. You're not thinking. Don't touch me. Stop it. I know your life is on hold. You're older, I know. But I like mature women. I like how you held up. You and me could make another rhyme together. Give Aaron- Shut your mouth! I just want to help you move on. Look at me. I'm in great shape. Do you really think anyone else in this Jesus party could take care of you like me? Where do you think you're going? To get Pastor Dawkins. You're not yourself. It'll be fine, but you need to... Oh! <gasps> I'm sorry, Doreen. You're not going anywhere. You're not thinking clear. Help! <sighs> Listen to me, you selfish bitch. You need to believe. I can love you. You can love me. It's allowed. Don't feel guilty. No! I only need you to stay still. You won't feel so guilty after this. I promise. I promise. I promise. Wow, you never know you had two kids. Look at you. Get off me! Get off! Ah! Damn it, woman! I am trying to be sincere here. I am in love with you. Can't you tell? Oh, you need a knife to prove it now? Now don't! Don't make me use this! Stop! You're hurting me! I can't breathe! Hey, Harris. <laughs> Jebediah. Hero of the hour. Where'd you get the hooch? Some carny shill named Hank up on top. Says he's a go-to guy for anything we need. You better keep an eye on him, Hero. Wow, you're pretty well lit. Nah. One thing I wanted to know, Captain America. Why does everybody seem to like you? Maybe it's because I don't stomp around here with a big scowl on my face barking orders to everybody. Maybe it's because I ask them how they're doing. What they need. Heh, <laughs> fair enough. 
So why aren't you nice to me? I am nice to you. You remind me of the guys I used to travel with in the show. Oh yeah, you were all big and bad in pro wrestling or whatever. That fake sport where men grease each other up and triumph each other. Yes, that's exactly it. And boys like you pay half their week's wage to come out, get drunk, and watch us. <laughs> Pretty awesome job, if you ask me. Why'd you quit? Jebediah, why do you even care? Jack told me to make nice with people, so I thought I'd fake interest and take notes for small talk down the road. <laughs> At least you're honest. You probably don't give a shit about these things, but I was a four-time regional middleweight champion. I was an A-list draw for the fair and carny circuit. Right up there with White Snake or Lover Boy. Smile when you say that. I like Lover Boy. I spent a lot of time with B-listers on their way up trying to impress the scouts for the big league. Every time there was a scout in town, I'd get big money for some promoter to play this big heel, put on a show, and take these nasty bumps. I've had more people land on me than an airport man. So you enjoyed being the has-been that everybody dumped on? See, that's why I'm not sharing my hooch with you, Jeb. You're not a nice person. What's the real reason you're asking me? Harris? Hey! I was wondering where you wandered off to. Hello, Jeb. Ma'am, I was just about to cite Mr. Harris here for public drinking and possession of contraband. Where are you now? Yeah, I just needed a witness. And here she is. Oh, come on now. We're in a storeroom. There's nobody here. It's not even remotely public. <sighs> yeah, well, I think his heroism in the face of abject stupidity has gone to Jeb's head. After what he did in lockdown, I'm guessing he's trying to keep up his reputation for failing upwards. Yeah, very funny. Okay, dear husband. I think I'll take the bottle now. Let's get you home. No, you're not. Come on, babe. <laughs> home? To a shelf in the plumbing section. You call that a home? We got walls made of cardboard and drywall. There's no privacy. There's like 50 people on our shelf. Ellen, I think you might want to take your boy home before he makes a fool of himself. Harris, baby, calm down. The mayor's going to have a little town hall. Maybe we can get some answers about the long term. Do you know how many people died outside when we shut the gates? Do you know how many people we left outside? Hey there, Harris. Easy. You know what Jack said. I don't care what that idiot said. We made a mistake. <laughs> what are we doing here, <laughs> Ellen? Uh, we've got to get Zeke. Get our things and go. Why would we do that? There's food. There are supplies. You said yourself those militia men couldn't get inside here, and the helicopters are coming. <clears throat> right? Don't, Harris. I swear. No, Ellen. They aren't. These people are just spinning wheels trying to figure out what to do. All right. You're going to spend some time upstairs to dry out and cool off. Like you did with Garrison. You're going to lock me away to cover up your stupidity. Let's go. Get your hands off me, rodent. You want to see what I'm capable of? You just try and move me. Harris, please, knock it off. We've got to get back. Regina's with Zeke. She's expecting us. <sighs> you and me are going to have words with Jack and the manager. We'll see how this goes down. Yeah. Until then, get the fuck out of my face. Go find us all the way out of here. Hero. Unbelievable. You're drinking again, picking a fight with Jeb. What is your problem? Did you hear me? 
They're lying to us about a way out. They want to keep us here, Ellen, with people like Jebediah watching out for us. I don't like this at all. Come on, settle down. Everyone is at their breaking point. I'm barely holding it together. Don't ask me to hold you together as well. I can't fucking do it, Harris. Come on. Let's go listen to the mayor. What do you want to do, sir? How many men do we have out there yet? Assuming they don't wander off waiting. About ten. Why aren't the guards coming inside here? They know we've got their leader. No, I don't think so. Something else is going on. They're waiting. Mrs. Garrison? The Doreen? Mr. Fisher, I'm... Sorry, I... What are you doing in here? You're half naked. It's indecent and... Are you all right, dear? Your arms. What happened? Please, just stay back. I borrowed a shirt from my... Just let me get cleaned up here. You're bleeding. You're filthy. Mr. Fisher, I would appreciate it if you would turn your back until I can get cleaned up. If you must know, I was out looking for Thomas. He said something about running off. I apologize, Mrs. Garrison. I thought it might be Thomas out here sneaking food from the pantry again. Is that how you got so dirty? I tried to persuade him to stay, but he insisted on running off. I even chased him to the fence, but I toppled over and, well, there we are. Another outfit ruined. And underwear, too, apparently. Mr. Fisher, that's lewd. Mrs. Garrison, I couldn't help but notice your hands. What about them? You have quite a bit of blood on them. Are you sure you don't need medical attention? I can fetch the pasta. No! Mr. Fisher, I would appreciate it if you would stop leering. I'm just concerned. Was Thomas injured? No. Those marks on your arms, Doreen, it looked like he was trying to keep you from going some way. What? Do you think I would leave my son here alone with you strangers? What kind of person do you think... Mrs. Garrison. Mrs. Garrison, please. That's not what I'm implying at all. Please calm down. Do not touch me! What's going on in here? Mr. Fisher, what is the meaning of this? Pastor, I... I... Doreen, what's happened to you? You've been in an accident. I'm fine. I'm fine. Please stop looking at me. Get those people away from the door. Okay, folks. Nothing to see here. Let's get back to the chapel. Pasadena is not quite ready for his sermon. Who did this to you? It doesn't matter. It's done. He's gone. Who's gone? Mrs. Garrison, I'm sorry. Please, put this on. I hope you don't mind, Reverend. I got it from the vestment closet. It's, it's fine. Fine. Reverend, Thomas is gone. Mr. Fisher! Thomas? Where's he gone? He moved on. He was tired of waiting. Damn it, Fisher! I knew you'd provoke someone to do something like this. In the middle of the night, on his own, he's only a child. I did no such thing. Thomas didn't want to leave here. Please, I would like you two to shut up and get out. If you want to help me, please find me something more to wear than this robe. It's like you fell down the entire mountainside. Just about. So I'd like to clean up without an audience. If you don't mind. Of course. Mr. Fisher, would you ask Mrs. Betts if she has anything in the repurposed closet? Of, of course. Please don't look at me like that. I want to help. What happened? One of the sheep left the flock. That's all. And? That is all. Of course. Please, I'll latch the door. Good people, if I might have a moment of your attention. Thank you. I was just a boy when I first thought the world was going to end. And I spent many nights in a city of ruins, 
huddled with my mother in a basement as people I did not know dropped bombs on a city in a land I thought was made of nothing but mud and rubble. But the nights of raining bombs came to an end. Men like my father returned home to help sweep away the debris and rebuild. The sun rose and the rains fell and seasons arrived in cycle. Year after year, that memory of dark times melted back into the shadows of an old man's memory. And then we had that darkest of nights several months ago. Locked down in a great concrete shelter, bullets flying, concrete and stone shattering, the sound of children weeping into the sleeve of their parents. Young ones, I remember a time like that and felt so blessed by the warmth of my mother, her soothing voice and her firm hand across my shoulder. I don't know why we made it here. Most of you have never been to Wish Well, and if not for the currents of panic frontaling through you, this part of the world would likely be the last place you'd choose to visit. This tiny, insignificant dollar on a hill, forgotten by all but a few who come more for its earthly views than its spiritual insights, has saved us. At least for now. There's a reason this church has no stained glass behind me, no stations of the cross of biblical images. The old pastor of this church, Reverend Amig, told me it was because no earthly tapestry of glass could rival the beauty of God's valley. We look out together in the first light of morning and we can almost forget, just for a moment, the horror and the tragedy. Up on this hill, looking down the valley in the town, it almost feels like nothing's wrong. We could just throw open the gates and rush out to find our loved ones. People, good people are dying outside our walls. Many of you have expressed great distress at being unable to save those people we shut out. Some even think it's an act of cowardice to close our doors on fellow survivors. I recall grown men weeping as they threw the bolt on our shelter door. Packed tighter than here, we could not take any more, and as the bombs fell, we accepted the shame of not being able to do more. As their pounding ebbed, the roaring and shaking of the earth prevailed, and we never knew what happened to those people out in the streets. Perhaps they found their own shelter, perhaps not. Sometimes we shut the door on our own neighbors, friends, even family, because there was no more room, no more room. Even as the snow falls and the cold winds rise, we cannot assume we are the only ones left or even that our friends at HG World are the only others left. Some of us have seen others, soldiers and survivalists, fighting for a new place out there. There are other places where people just like us are struggling. We've simply lost our ability to communicate with them. But we are not infants. We understand the concept of object permanence. That which disappears behind the wall does not, in fact, disappear. It will be there when the door opens or the wall falls. We can be a refuge. We can build a community if we find a way to work together. And we have the room. On this chill autumn morning, I had the disturbing duty this morning of touring the roof with a number of our constables. And I am here to assure you that this terrible choice was the correct one. As I stared down across what was once the threshold of commerce, I was mortified to see hundreds of monsters listlessly staggering about the bloodied ground. We saw the soulless faces of our enemy gathered at the front gates, smashing themselves against the outer doors still after a dozen or more hours. Restless, relentless they are. So here I am, 67 years after the last bomb fell on a London city street, frightened by what might emerge from the darkness and huddled with strangers in a cold darkness. And I am reminded of what got me through those days. The morning broke. Just as this morning, I could smell bacon cooking on a makeshift stove 
I could see these strangers had transformed in the night into friends and neighbors, strengthened and bound together by their common threat, united against the outsiders who would do them harm. And I am reminded of those qualities in all of you, in the admirable and selfless ways you've supported one another. I am sure that, for the duration at least, we could make a go of it here, in this place. As God or fate would have it, we have supplies and the knowledge to protect, provide, and shelter us. We have allies on the outside who will help us. And someday, when the righteous and the strong turn the tide against these monsters, we will have preserved man's greatest qualities, and we can open that gate and greet our fellow survivors to rebuild this world in his name. Let us pray. Here. We have great walls, but we have great leaders. Leaders who have organized and taken action and who have given unto us a world where we can see those greatest traits in ourselves and share them. We might share them and rebuild the world we always dreamed could be with the values we choose and the ideals we have struggled to protect. And once the doors are open once more and the faces we see below are of men and women and children who've survived, we can bring unto them this bravest of new worlds. Not only survivors, my friends, but conquerors, conquerors of death, of undeath, and torchbearers emerging from the blackest night to reignite the world in our image. Yes, friends, good will come of this. In the names of all you've lost and in the names of all you've loved, we will prevail. We must prevail. HG World Episode 6, Part 2. It's a world of dread and fear. Featured Frank Bedeni as dad. Mark Zaracor as Dawkins. Jules Ishmael as Dirk and Kirk. Lee Sands as Dogberry, Tracy Hall as Doreen, Steve Cox as Fish, Michael L. Stokes as Grant, Audio Elon as Green, Ryan Smith as Hicks, Glenn Bartram as Hugh, D.T. Kelly as Jeb, Shane Harris as the Mayor, Ayub Cody as McGinnis, Dedrick Jensen Woodard as Olson. Becca Rhinus as Ronnie. Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard as Joe. Kimberly Giannopoulos as Sergeant Wake. Eric Avedition as Thomas. Keith R.A. DeCandido as Todd Rage. And Ron Runeborg as Ying. This episode was written and directed by Jay Smith, edited by Michael L. Stokes. Dialogue processing and digital services provided by Michael Stokes. Production assistance by Martha Limbo Terrar, Carol Stokes, Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard, and Ginny Swan. Production logo and additional art by Adriana Limbo Terrar. This show was edited with Magic's Music Maker and Reaper, with some sound effects from freesound.org. For a full list of Freesound contributors, please visit us at www.goodmorningsurvivors.com. Jonathan Colton appears courtesy of the Creative Commons license. Visit jonathancolton.com for music downloads and concert information. Salut Tom, c'est Bob. Je poste dans le bureau du fond. Cool de te revoir, comment ça va? A great cast deserves a second mention. Featured in Season Zero were Eric Avedition, Glenn Bartram, Frank Bedeni, DJ Bro, Steve Cox, Keith R.A. DeCandido, Stacy Dukes, John S. Drew, Tracy Angelina Evans, UG Foster, M. Sierra Garcia, Kimberly Giannopoulos, Tracy Hall, Shane Harris, Jules Ishmael, Dedrick Jensen Woodard, Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard, D.T. Kelly, A.U. Cody, 
Martha Limbo Terran, Cheryl Malcolm, Becca Reines, Ron Runeborg, Lee Sands, Dustin Shanafelter, Lance Schoenberg, Ryan Smith, Carol Stokes, Michael L. Stokes, Jimmy Swan, Dayton Ward, Scott C. Wentworth, Roy Winger, Mark Zaracor, Audio Elon. You're listening to Tuesday Terrors on the Mutual Audio Network. Tomorrow is our weekly anthology for science fiction and fantasy as Lothar Tuppen brings you Wednesday Wonders. Subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of amazing audio or find the Wednesday Wonders feed in your favorite podcast player. And thank you for listening, everybody.